George, it leads the innovation practice at Stratalis. I always say that wrong, I know. It's the Australian in me again. Um, and we really appreciate you taking us through. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Oh, we can do better than that. I know it's dark in here and it's warm and all that jazz, so I'm going to ask you one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Now that's more like it. Hi, everyone. My name is George Hemingway. As Pam said, I run the innovation practice for Stratalis, and I'm here to talk to you about trust. I'm here to talk to you about transformation. I'm here to talk to you about one of the greatest showstoppers facing the mining industry as we seek to transform in the future. I won't spend too much time introducing the company, but just a little bit in case you want to know. I run the practice for Stratalis. We're a growth strategy and innovation consultancy. And what we do is advise the CEOs, the boards, the head of strategy, heads of innovation for some of the world's largest companies on uncertainty and the future. Whether that is helping them set their mind of the future visions in the mining industry or helping them understand what technologies are out there that can help them think differently about the future or simply helping them understand where to grow and, and how to play and where to win. Uh, we sort of help them think through these problems and with a real focus on the future of industry. And we do this across a wide array of industries and companies. And this is important because I'm not going to spend most of the first half of my presentation talking about mining. And the reason for this is that there's a lot we can learn from other industries and apply to the mining industry. And so I want to talk today about trust I want to talk today about transformation, and I want to talk today about what it's going to take for us to become something new and different and better. We live in incredibly uncertain times. We live in a fractured world that is seemingly changing, seemingly growing apart at every minute. And in this world, in a flash, titans of industry can become global pariahs. Billion dollar companies that are meant to be the future of work can end up not working out at all. Our friends become our enemies, and suddenly our enemies are our friends. I mean, we live in a crazy and uncertain place. And throughout all of this time, we, people, and the businesses that we fill, think that the experiences we have of the past, the knowledge, the education, is somehow going to guide us successfully into the future. Like, that's all we need in order to conquer the uncertainty that's coming. The truth is, we kind of end up feeling like tacos that didn't see Tuesday coming, unable to keep up with the accelerating rate and pace of change. Now, what the interesting thing is, is that in an increasingly unpredictable world, human beings react in exceedingly predictable ways. About half of us rebel. We fight against the injustices or the perceived injustices that we have of the world. And uh, we've seen this throughout history. Uh, take the... Um, the hippies during Vietnam, or uh, just a few years ago, uh, the Occupy Wall Streeters, the 99% protesting against the excesses of the banking industry and the 1%, right? And we see this as well uh, here in the political spectrum, right? On one side, we've got nationalism and populism and isolationism. On the other side, we've got socialism. Some could even argue communism. And what is that? That is a societal and a human reaction to the discomfort of uncertainty and change. We don't know what to do, so we find some way to rally against the things that bother us. That's about 50% of us. Now, the other 50% of us react in an entirely different way. We seek comfort. We seek things that we trust, right? Whether it's uh, patriotism or, or religion or for some brands or celebrities, we're looking to ground ourselves in times of great uncertainty and discomfort. Now, whether you're the sort of person that likes to rally up against the inequalities of the world or, or you seek a more uh, gentler type of change and approach, there is a common thread through the stories we tell ourselves, a kind of heroic saga. Unstoppable enemies emerge, the courageous rise to meet them, villains fall, and in the end, all is good with the world. We live happily ever after. Now, what does this have to do with business and mining? Everything. Because the mining industry is at a point where it seeks to transform fundamentally as it has not done in centuries. And now, we have the technology, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the will, we have the need, and we have a challenge. 
one that we do not overcome, we will not be able to transform. And today, I'd like to talk to you about that challenge. Now, in the past, if you were a business, all you really had to do to be successful was make a lot of money, right? Profit with a capital P. Take Walmart, 40 years of year-on-year of -year returns and dividends, and I mean, ignore the fact that along the way, some would argue they kind of decimated small-town American retail. People protested, but did it stop them? No, because this was progress. This is what we expected from our commercial enterprises, right? And it's not just in retail. Take a look at Hollywood, right? Miramax, lots of shiny gold statues, made plenty of money. And because of that, the industry was willing, I guess, to ignore the fact that the guy that ran the place was kind of a jerk. Because that's not what we expected. We didn't expect Harvey Weinstein to be a great guy. We expected him to pump out Oscars and make money for his investors. But what's happened is that our old view of the world is starting to change, right? Back then, profit, profit was the hero, right? As you can tell, Hercules and I have the, the same physique. And as long as you had profit with a capital P, you were okay. But something changed along the way, and no one told Walmart for a while. Something started to matter, the rules of the game started to change, where value started to come from started to change. And businesses that couldn't keep up started to have a hard time with it. So uh, take a look at Walmart. Walmart always made lots of money, right? Now think of Whole Foods. Whole Foods, not exactly a business that made a lot of money. Struggled, right? Great place to get your organic kale, but not so great if you wanted to make money. Amazon comes in, buys Whole Foods. The day they buy Whole Foods, stock rises enough to pay for all of Whole Foods and a little left over for organic champagne for the staff. It doesn't make any sense. Those aren't the rules. That's not how value is made. Now imagine if Walmart had tried to buy Whole Foods instead of Amazon. Do you think the same thing would have happened? No, because Walmart was playing by a different set of rules than Whole Foods was. The game had changed, and you had two people playing by two different sets of rules. Now, the interesting thing is this. When we look at industries that are ripe for disruption at Stratalus, we tend to notice four things that sort of are a thread throughout them. I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'd like you to pay attention to just one. Industries where customers want to see existing companies change. And when I say customers, I, I also mean consumers, I mean governments, I mean society. And that's critical for the natural resources industry because it's going to help us understand how value is changing in the industry as well. We've seen this before, right? If, if people don't like you, they're happy to leave you. Um, Blockbuster made about 40% of its profit from late fees, about 18% of its revenue. Nobody likes late fees. If there's someone in here that likes late fees, I want to have a conversation with you because you're like a real divergent thinker. So when Netflix came along and offered an opportunity to get away from that, what did we do? We bailed. Bye-bye Blockbuster. And it's not just retail. It's always the same thing in banking as well. So banking, for example, a little closer to mining. Why? Well, lots of regulations, lots of rules, lots of compliance, lots of processes. Last few years haven't been particularly kind. I just came from a bank this past weekend talking to the board about the increasing level of costs in a world in which other people are showing up without them. And in this world, what do you do? Well, you push fees. Read your banking statement. You'll see the same thing I see. They're making lots of money off of me in return for me giving them my money to make lots of money off. And that gives you a lot of very profitable but unhappy customers, which shouldn't surprise you at all that if you look at the last five years of complaints in the banking industry, they're on the up, they're showing no sign of decline. It also shouldn't surprise you that most Americans would rate a technology company higher on those drivers of choice and loyalty than they rate their primary bank. Which then also shouldn't surprise you that if you asked the average American, would they be willing to consider a bank that came from a technology company? Most of them would say, well, I mean, look, I'm probably going to stick with Citibank for now, but that idea isn't crazy to me. But technology companies can't be banks, right? Because there are regulations stopping them, right? Just like, just like the mining industry has. Except Uber does car loans. I mean, they compete directly with banks, right? Now, they don't do it to everybody, they do it to their drivers, but that's part of banking. 
Or how about the 800 pound gorilla in any room? Look at Amazon. If you took all of the products and services that Amazon has and you slapped them up against Chase's website, what would you find? You'd find that Amazon kind of looks like a bank. But don't tell anyone, because banks face regulations that Amazon does not. A different set of rules, because society is valuing something different that makes them willing to change and push for change. So, you know, in mining, if you can't mine it, you must grow it, right? So let's say if you can't grow it, you must mine it, right? So these are like these two fundamental industries that we can't replace. Never in a hundred years would it occur to me to say, hey, honey, do you mind getting a couple of Petri dishes? I'm going to slap them on a grill. But that's what's going on right now. There are people that are trying to grow meat in the lab. And there are people that are trying to grow tuna in a lab. Now, why would anyone want lab-grown tuna? I mean, it's not going to taste better than tuna from the sea, is it? Is it going to be more tuna-y? Is it going to be cheaper than tuna from the sea? Probably not. What could possibly compel us? What is that underlying societal change that would make us want to do that? Now, we know we can grow meat in the lab, sort of. We know we can grow tuna in the lab, eventually. We know we can grow diamonds in the lab. Let's say one day we can do nickel in the lab or gold in the lab. Would people want to buy it? Is there something that, even if it's more expensive and not as good, that would drive society to say, lab-grown nickel sounds good to me? And if so, what would that mean for the mining industry? Here's an interesting thought. You know, if you consider where the industry is going in terms of technology transformation, right? Artificial intelligence and automation and, and self-correcting machines, right? Now imagine you've got this ABB, IBM, Hitachi, Komatsu, Caterpillar, Sandvik, Ocker, JV, mega company that'll one day swallow us all up, right? And we're all buying the same stuff from everybody and we're all using the same self-correcting, self, you know, analyzing machines. Well, in that world, and again, I understand not every ore body is the same, but in that world, would operational advantage still be the competitive advantage between mining company A and mining company B? And if it's not the performance of your operations, because someone else is running the thing anyway that does it, what is going to differentiate the winners, and more importantly, the losers of tomorrow? So I'm going to ask you guys to play a game. I'm only going to make you do this twice, so I'm going to ask for everybody's participation, all right? Let's say that you ran a corporate park, right? You had all these office buildings and so forth and so on, and your office building was right in the center. You got to choose who your new neighbor was going to be, right next to you, listening day and night, and you had two choices. A Swiss company, land of chocolate and cuckoo clocks, right? Or a Russian company. All in favor of the Swiss, kindly raise your hands. Interesting. All in favor of the Russians. That's more than I usually get. Thank you, you four. It's interesting as well, if you look at the nominal cost of a Big Mac around the world, you know what it means in US dollars, you'll notice that from the big economies, the most expensive Big Mac is in Switzerland. And I'll let you guess where the least expensive one is. What is it about the way you voted and the success or failure of an economy and the price of a Big Mac that could be related? Let's play this one more time. I told you I would do this twice. Your choice number one, land of fun and childhood and imagination, Disney, or Verizon. It's a little tougher. All in favor of Disney. Interesting. All in favor of Verizon. Now, that doesn't usually happen. So there is something that drives the choices we make the reason that we go with a Disney or a Verizon, or a Russia or a Switzerland, there's something that binds together why we choose who we choose and why we decide to follow companies or revolt against them, why we decide to rebel or seek comfort. And that is trust. Trust is the new competitive advantage and yeah, you'll say, okay, but trust always matters. Yes, it always matters. But something has fundamentally changed in the world around us that has made it more important than it was in the past. Trust is the difference between a Wells Fargo that was, well, one of the most trusted companies in the West, 
and the Wells Fargo today that struggles. Trust is the difference between a Facebook where you would go to share photos with grandma and, and meet all your high school friends that you never want to see in real life, and the post-Cambridge Analytica world where Bernie is trying to make that evil billionaire pay and the EU is trying to break it up. Trust will be the differentiator between mining companies that are able to transform and grow on a global scale and those that will struggle. And we don't just see this in mining, we also see it in the periphery of the industry, right? And this is having a major impact, for example, in Canada as well with the elections, for those of you that are Canadian. You've got Cadelco, a mining company, not exactly, by the way, as an industry considered the most trusted by the general populace, saying, hey, we don't want to associate with you, that's not really good for our brand. Trust is driving the difference. And don't just take my word for it. Take the word of the nice folks at the Harvard Business Review, because if they wrote it, it must be true. Great companies aren't just companies that deliver profit. They're also companies that deliver value to society. They are companies that are trusted. And when you look at this concept of a triple bottom line, right? People, profit, planet. This is what great companies, successful companies, need to be, according to those leaders. What is it really saying? It's saying, shareholders, trust us, we'll make you money. People, trust us, we'll take care of you, we'll do the right thing. Planet, trust us, we'll be responsible. Trust is the key to capturing value in the future. Trust is the key to transformation. Now, as I said previously, trust has always mattered, right? So what's the difference? The difference is that 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, if you made money and you did a good job operating the business that you had, you were probably okay. I mean, after all, industry wasn't changing all that much in most industries. You stayed in a relatively static world. You didn't need to transform. You needed to pump out money and run the business you knew how to run. But the difference is that today, every single industry must transform or find itself, well, out of work. Trust, with a capital T, has now taken its place along profit with a capital P. And those who don't have it will not be able to change, because change requires trust. And why? For the same reason it always has. We rely on people, not just to do the change, but to allow us to make those changes. Look at WeWork, all right? In a space of uh, goodness, less than a year, they've gone from IPO to, I don't know. This week, they're laying off 3,000 people. Now, did anyone actually expect them to make money? No, I mean, they didn't make money last year. They didn't make money the year before. No one expected them to make money this year. It's like Uber. They still don't make money. So what's the difference? The difference is that at some point, there's only so long people will trust you if you're flying around in private jet and hiring Gwyneth Paltrow's cousin to be your office energy healer. She's really a thing. She works there. She's the energy healer. Trust is the reason it all fell apart. Now let's look at the mining industry, all right? Mining industry is an industry that's transforming. It's all true, we're all trying to do it, but it's not an industry that necessarily had to change for a while. And some would argue, although quietly, it's not an industry that necessarily needs to change now. Why? Well, first of all, we need mining. You've got captive customers. There's still no magical lab-grown nickel. Governments and society are dependent on the money that mining makes, and marklets are cyclical. What goes down, we all know, must come up. And because of that, what do you got? You've got built-in license to operate. You've got demand. You've got capital. Why change? So because of that, while the rest of the world gets smaller, this little guy over here can invade a country all by itself, mining industry gets larger. While the rest of the world becomes more modular and flexible, the mining industry, more capital intensive, more fixed in one spot. And while the rest of the world becomes more diverse, the mining industry, despite its best efforts by some, still looks a little bit like the Lego management team a few years ago. 
I was reading this week that BHP had moved from 17% to 22.3% women. And that's a great thing, and they're continuing that acceleration and that work. They're proud of that, and they should be. But 22% women in any other industry would be viewed as, well, not so great. Haven't really needed to change. So where and why is the change slowly coming? Look at the world we're in. We live, as I said, in a world that is more and more uncertain and fractured. We live in a world where people feel there is a widening gap between the rich and the poor, where there's an inequality. You saw it years ago, Occupy Wall Street, Tahir Square in Egypt. You're seeing it now in Hong Kong. Le Pen, Orban in Hungary, Trump here. People reacting to the uncertainty of this change. And in mining jurisdictions in countries, it's among the most challenging and the worst. At the same time, at the same time that people are more passionate about the environment, we are seeing more and more and more severe environmental events. And right or wrong, guess who they blame? They're not blaming Disney. In a world that is more and more connected, companies have to react, as do countries and regulators, which is why you see countries trying to ban combustion engines. Someday sometimes means they just don't know how to do it yet. It's why you see the CEO of Shell saying, my next car will be electric. You're seeing the fundamental change because value is changing and the world is pushing us. We have no choice. Even tightly controlled economies and societies like China have no choice. They absolutely must react because value has changed, the rules have changed, and those that don't have trust aren't changing along with them. And that's why you see, for example, in New York City, regulators are more than happy to, to go along with this sort of thing. They sued right, the energy companies, not for causing climate change, because that would just fall apart, but for not accounting for it properly in their financial statements. Fraud. Because fraud, you know, you can prosecute. See the same thing in Canada, for example. Imagine 40 years ago, someone saying, I don't know if we'll get that mining permit because of the caribou. And yet we had a genuine conversation with a Canadian mining company about whether or not they would get the permits because of the caribou. They're really concerned, genuinely, about the whole project. The world has changed, and we need to change with it. There are 118 elements on the periodic table. 75% of them, or 75 of them, are in an iPhone. So you would think Apple would be your greatest ally. Nothing could be further than the truth. Apple is trying to draw a green line between themselves and you. That's why they have machines that are recycling iPhones so they can say, we, we're not you know, doing this with mining. No, 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 your lovely little iPhone, that came from recycling, right? No mining involved in that. They're trying to make you the villain in their story. I'm gonna let you guess who the hero is. Did I say there were 118 elements? I lied. There are apparently 119 because Apple invented a whole new aluminum in order to make their iPhones. Didn't know that? Well, they'll convince others that it's true. They're the hero of this story, and the only question is, what role will you play in it? And the mining industry isn't making it easy. So for the last year, we've been working with mining companies on technology around tailings, on technology around energy, and it's great. It is a concerted and real effort but is it enough for BHP or Valet or Rio or Freeport to do it? Is that going to move the needle enough to change the world's perception? It's going to take collaboration. It's going to take more than just the leaders because we live in a world where artificial intelligence and automation and new technologies are showing up and there is a fear, real or imagined that somehow these things are going to replace all of us, yes, even the consultants, that somehow we won't have a role. And in that world, it is not whether technology and transformation is feasible that is the greatest uncertainty. It is not whether our ability to implement it is the greatest uncertainty. The greatest uncertainty facing the mining industry is one of acceptance. It is one of trust. Because the world is more than happy to blame the pharmaceutical companies, the financial services companies, the mining companies, there is a wave of change. 
washing over the world. And when there is a wave of change, there are only two reactions you can have that give you a chance of surviving and flourishing. You can be like the oak, you can stand strong against that wave, and that works for some. And I'll talk about who it works for and who it doesn't, but the vast majority of us have to take the other tack. We have to ride the wave. We have to become part of the change. Now, let's say you're like the oak, okay? Where does this work for? This works for the number one player in the industry, economies of scale, economies of scope. It can snap up everybody else that's suffering, probably protected by government or governments or regulations. These companies are the last person standing, and they can survive this wave of change. So, Think of buggy whips. So these, are, these are the things that you'd use when you have a horse and carriage, or whip the, whip the horse. These, ladies and gentlemen, are some very, very high quality buggy whips made by one of the last remaining buggy whip companies. And if you'd like one, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. But let's imagine you were a buggy whip company back in 1894. This is Fifth Avenue in New York City, Easter Day, 1894. Can anyone find the car? Hands of anyone can find the car. It's kind of like, where's Waldo? All right, it's right there. Less than 20 years later, Fifth Avenue, Easter Day. Can anyone find the horse? And if that was a fast rate of change, wait till you see what's coming for us today. So if you're not the last remaining buggy whip company, who are you? You're someone that's going to ride that wave. And the industry and the leaders of that industry know it to be true. That is why BHP is talking about moving from social license to social value, putting that T with a capital T right next to the capital P. That is why Anglo is so passionate, Mark is so passionate about the development partner framework. Trust. That is why Valet is working on power shift to reduce GHGs and not just impact themselves, but upstream and downstream, the industries and the world around us. Because trust is going to be key to transformation. Companies don't do this because they like whales. It's not why we save the whales. They do it because society wants us to do good as permission for us to make money. That's the world we live in today. So I called Mark up. I said, Mark, I'm giving a, a talk on, on trust and transformation. Is this stuff important? He said, it's absolutely right. Anglo's ability to transform is reliant on being able to make a contract, a social contract based on trust with the communities around it. Without that, transformation cannot happen. And more importantly, it cannot happen with only one mining company. All of us have to come together because it is not any one single mining company that is on the receiving end. It is the entire industry. Only as an industry that collaborates, that works together to build trust with a capital T and convinces society that that is what we are doing, will we have the permission to transform for tomorrow. Thank you very much.